Hello, and welcome to Policy and Advocacy in Action, a channel of NRCTV Radio. My name is Miriam Durrani, and today I will be speaking to Maya Hasek, the Human Trafficking Program Director from the program Tapestry in Georgia. We'll be talking about all things human trafficking during, of course, January, Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Thank you, Maya, for joining me today. Let's get right to the questions. So, Maya, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role at Tapestry, and how Tapestry works with survivors of human trafficking? Sure, um, and thank you so much for having me on the show. So, um, I am the Anti-Human Trafficking Program Director here at Tapestry. I initially started in 2008 as a caseworker. So, I worked directly with victims of human trafficking at that time. Um, and then later on, I did training, um, and now I am in charge of the more administrative side, um, supervision of other case managers, as well as um, a training component. But just a little bit about Tapestry. So we are a nonprofit social service agency, and we work with survivors of human trafficking, domestic violence, um, and excuse me, and domestic violence within the refugee and immigrant communities. We initially started um, as a coalition of different uh, resettlement organizations back in 1996 uh, to directly respond to the needs of domestic violence survivors, specifically coming from refugee and immigrant uh, communities. Fast forward to 1998, we adopted the name Tapestry. Um, and then in 2002, we were officially a standalone 501c3 nonprofit organization. So, um, as you can probably gather, we initially started as a domestic violence program, but we qu quickly learned that there was another aspect of the stories that we were hearing. Um, when the federal definition of human trafficking came out in 2000, we realized that some of the individuals that we were serving through our domestic violence program were also uh, victims of, of human trafficking. So, officially in 2004, we started our anti-human trafficking program through which we provide um, training to law enforcement, social service providers, um, students, faith-based communities, and anybody and everybody that's interested in learning how to identify potential uh, trafficking cases, um, as well as uh, we started providing comprehensive case management uh, to foreign national survivors of human trafficking. Wow, thank you so much, Maya, for all the work that you do and all that Tapestry does. So can you talk to me about what human trafficking actually is and how prevalent is it? Sure. Um, since we work with foreign nationals, we utilize the federal definition of human trafficking, which is using force, fraud, or coercion to recruit, harbor, transport, obtain, or employ a person for labor or services in involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And sex trafficking is a commercial sex act induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the act involves a minor. So essentially, if you have um, a minor under the age of 18 that is engaging, engaging in any type of commercial sex act um, where something of value is exchanged for that act, uh, that individual is automatically uh, deemed or seen as um, a victim of human trafficking or more so specifically sex trafficking. Um, whereas uh, when you look at labor trafficking, um, Regardless of the age, you uh, you have to show that there has been forced fraud or coercion you used to induce um, somebody to form some type of a service um, or um, a labor. So that can be in any type of industry. That can be a one-time service, or that can be um, a, a labor that you know spans over many years. Um, it's, oh, your second question being how prevalent is it? Um, there's a lot of data uh, floating around um, about the number of trafficking cases out there, but um, it is actually quite hard to estimate the, the real numbers. The, the numbers we go by are the numbers that are given to us by the United States government. 
and that puts an estimate of approximately 600 to 800,000 people each year within the United States um, that are engaged in some type of um, human trafficking, labor, or in, induced into labor or sex trafficking. Whereas we're, we're, when we look at individuals coming uh, from outside of the, the country into the United States for the purpose of um, you know, uh, labor trafficking or sex trafficking, we're talking about um, anywhere between 14,500 to 17,500, um, you know, in the individuals. That is a lot of individuals. I can't even imagine uh, who is not being counted. That is absolutely wild. You know, I know from your explanation of of how human trafficking is defined, so that can get a little complicated. So are there any myths that you hear of or that are really common about human trafficking that you think it's important to dispel? Absolutely. There are many myths out there about human trafficking, um, and some of them are a result of, you know, the, the media, uh, not so much the media, but um, I would say maybe even some of the movies that have been um, uh, a little more uh, dramatic in a in a sense, if you will. Of course, some of the movies do, in fact, depict some of the trafficking situations. But there are, um, you know, situations where you might not see any force being, um, you know, used in a in a trafficking case. For the individuals that tapestry serves, um, we have mostly seen coercion being one of the main uh, driving factors for why individuals do not escape their, their situation. So being afraid of um, what is going to happen to them or their families if they um, attempt to leave the trafficker. Another myth that, um, you know, we, we see is that, you know, survivors of human trafficking will, will immediately bond with a social worker and will identify um, as victims of human trafficking, and that's just not the case. Um, most often, it takes um, a very long time to build that trust with the survivor to actually um, get somebody to come forward and say, yes, this is actually what happened to me, um, and uh, to, to realize that what happened to them was not their fault and that they do, in fact, meet the definition of, of human trafficking. Thanks, Maya. You know, I know you talked about how hard it is for someone who is being trafficked to actually disclose that and gain the trust of an advocate or a social worker. So how do you actually go about identifying survivors? Sure. Well, like I mentioned previously, we utilize a federal definition of human trafficking. And just to make it a little bit easier, we also use the AMP model, which is action means purpose. Um, and that can be easily found on the internet. But basically, we look at what is the action that was used um, to kind of lure the, the individual. So that could be anything from recruitment, um, harboring an individual, transporting, uh, providing, or obtaining an individual um, through the means of force, fraud, or coercion. And then what is the purpose? So the purpose being either involuntary servitude, peonage, dead bondage, um, or slavery. But just to go back, um, you know, to, to building that trust, we do not expect to, um, to, to find the answers or to fit somebody into every one of these categories, the action means and purpose in the, in, in the initial screening or even in the initial 10 screenings. So it's really critical to build that trust, um, it to in order to um, to screen somebody for human trafficking, I will also say that uh, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center um, also has a has many different um, screening tools available with specific questions for specific industries. So, an individual that may have been referred to me, let's say, as a potential case of sex trafficking, um, I would not use. Um, you know, cases, I would not use questions that were related to agriculture. So it's really important to, to listen and to have more of an open discussion when conducting a screening because uh, you never know what an, an individual will identify. 
like an individual of sex trafficking may in fact identify more so with with labor. That's really interesting. I think it's so important to think about all the different ways that someone could be trafficked. And, you know, that's such a great advocacy tactic to just be open to, you know, everything that someone is experiencing. You know, I know you touched on this just a little bit, but in terms of the cross of labor and maybe sex trafficking. So if uh, a survivor of human trafficking is already being screened for, you know, say domestic violence or sexual assault, uh, how do you screen for human trafficking? Do you think it's important that you screen for multiple identities that that survivor has? How does that all work in practice? Absolutely. Um, even when we do a screening for human trafficking, since you know we are a human trafficking program, we also do a screening of domestic violence, just because you know, different crimes and different situations that an individual may have lived for, uh, lived through, excuse me, may warrant additional uh, resources and services. So an example of this would be, let's say I'm working with a survivor of sex trafficking and I'm providing services that are more ta- tailored toward their uh, sex trafficking experience. Um, they may also have experienced domestic violence within their lifetime or even after they were out of their trafficking situation. So they might need services such as assistance with temporary protective order, um, custody battles, divorce, uh, things of that nature. So it's really important to have access to screening tools across multiple forms of uh, victimization. So for us, you know, that uh, let's say we have a domestic violence case and the husband is forcing the vi- a wife to, um, uh, you know, to to work at a factory. Then we would stop and ask, you know, well, you know, does she really have a choice? Has there been force, fraud, or coercion utilized to um, to keep her uh, compliant? What is he doing with the money? Does she have access to the to the money? Can she quit her job if she uh, wanted to to do so? So. You know, looking at what freedoms have been taken away from somebody and really seeing, you know, if they meet this definition or maybe they meet, you know, uh, their more their situation is more so in line with another crime. Well, there might be resources available to um, to better uh, meet their needs um, at another organization or a program. That's so important. I think it also just shows, uh, you know, how creative advocates are because so many survivors have so many different needs and there are so many different ways. I think it just, you know, I feel like you're just highlighting how really what survivors need are just options. Um, So I know you talked about what some of the challenges survivors have with uh, disclosing of, you know, what's happened to them, maybe with their freedoms being limited. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you see? And, you know, do you have any ideas for how to overcome those challenges? Sure. Well, um, you know, I think that each individual has their own challenges. I already discussed the self-identification, which is critical, which really prevents people from, you know, seeking help. So screening is um, is, is instrumental in, in this field. Um, other challenges include um, even accepting services from service providers because, um, you know, especially the, the foreign nationals that we have worked with, they often think that there is going to be a cost to a service. So it's really important to say that, you know, all services are free and that they're not going to incur a debt as a result of receiving services from from our organization. Um, some of the bigger challenges or bigger picture challenges out there, of course, are housing. You know, um, even looking at the domestic violence field, um, there's just there are not enough shelters available for emergency placement for victims of domestic violence and even more so, you know, for um, for victims of, of human trafficking. Now, for us, we might choose to place a, a survivor in a domestic violence shelter, but that um, is, is limited to, uh, to some individuals. 
what do we do when we have a male survivor of labor trafficking whose only option may be to look at a homeless shelter? You know, that's not always the best option. So I say all of these things because housing continues to be one of the the greatest uh, needs that we have out there. So how can we resolve this this challenge? I would say that, you know, we really need to look at some uh, non-conventional conventional, conventional uh, housing options like um, working through utilizing even Airbnb uh, for some emergency stay um, if the individual is, is not in crisis. Uh, working with landlords to um, get them to um, uh, rent apartments to our clients even if they don't have the documentation or the best credit. Um, working with resettlement organizations to kind of piggyback off of the, the partnerships that they have uh, already developed um, when it comes to housing. And of course, working with the continuum of care um, to really highlight some of the housing challenges that, uh, that we are seeing. So, and, and lastly, um, I mean, there are many different challenges that we could discuss, but I would also like to highlight finding employment. Uh, some individuals um, might have um, convictions on their record. They might have felonies, making it extremely hard to, to find employment or even get through that background check. So we really need um, employers that are willing to overlook that. And we also need, um, we need state courts to um, help us with vacating convictions. I know that New York has a great court, but, you know, some of the other states are very much behind when it comes to, to that. Um, and, and, of course, um, you know, when we're looking at employment, we're also looking, looking at, um, you know, the individuals that we work with, they might, not, they might have specific skills. So um, in addition to, uh, to receiving help with employment, um, you know, we need to really think about education and, and job training to really assist somebody in becoming uh, independent and self-sufficient down the line. Thank you, Maya, for pointing all that out. You know, I think it's so important because when a landlord is assessing a rental application, they may see things that they don't like. You know, when an employer is looking at someone's history, they might see things that make them nervous and they may not realize that someone is a victim of human trafficking. You know, someone may have all these multiple identities and all these reasons why things happen to them. Uh, so I think, you know, that's a really important point and, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, we know that housing, you know, is a, is a challenge for everyone and I can't even imagine what it is like if you are facing all these hurdles. So just from your experience, you know, I, I know you've been with Tapestry for a little while and have had that direct service experience. Do you have a story of a client or someone that you worked with that, that stays with you? Uh, it could be, you know, for a positive reason or a negative reason, just something that you, you know, that you think about uh, with a story. Uh, wow, uh, there are many stories that I, you know, think about throughout the years, but um, I can maybe talk so uh, more so in general terms of a pattern that uh, that kind of stays with me because so many, um, you know, individuals that that we have ser- served um, kind of follow the same pattern of recruitment, um, and that is. Um, you know, young females in uh, smaller villages of of Mexico being approached by um, by young, attractive males who um, pose as they are interested in a in a romantic relationship with them. So um, they go so far as to meet the um, the victim's family members, to introduce the victim to their parents, um, and then all of a sudden. Um, you know, the trafficker tells the victim that he's going to have to travel to the United States um, to do some work and that she could accompany him um, to the United States and also find a part-time job in order to help her family um, in, in, let's say, in, in Mexico. So she agrees, thinking that they are in a romantic relationship. Um, she uh, She thinks that she's doing something, you know, uh, in order to help her family uh, members 
um, in her home country. But then uh, once she ends up in the United States, when she comes here, the first night that she arrives, she's told that, you know, she has a quota of, um, you know, sleeping with 20 men each and every uh, night. Um, and in one particular case, um, the one that resonates the most with me, it was a case of two sisters that were brought to the United States by, uh, by, by two cousins who romanced them, who promised them, um, you know, a, a better life, a great relationship. But once they arrived here, they separated them and they used that separation to control um, them and keep them compliant uh, and, and pretty much force them into, into prostitution. So um, the case of the two sisters will forever resonate with me and, um, and just the, the reunification of the two of them when the traffickers finally went to jail and when they could, you know, see each other and spend time with, with one another was um, def- definitely a me- memorable moment in my mind. Well, Maya, those are some patterns that, you know, I think definitely are enough to keep anyone up at night. You know, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's so important to be aware of and also to think about the ways that human traffickers actually use power and control to get victims to do what they want. Um, you know, I know we don't have very much time left, but I just wanted to close by asking you, you know, do you have any advice for anyone listening to this podcast today? What are some things that people can actually do to help serve survivors of trafficking, how do you prevent it? You know, what do you do if you're just a person wandering around in the world? Sure. Um, if you're if you're not within this field, I would say, you know, educate yourself. Uh, really spend some time uh, doing some research. Get to know what uh, trafficking really looks like. You can visit the OVC, uh, Training and Technical Assistance, website. Um, they have an amazing training video called uh, Faces of Trafficking. You never know when you're going to come across a potential um, a potential victim that you know that you can help um, get out of that uh, situation. You can also uh, donate to trustworthy organizations um, or volunteer your time. You can check out a list of great organizations at uh, Freedom Network USA. Dot org, So it's kind of like a national coalition across the United States uh, with some really amazing service providers. So you can always team up with them and, you know, um, help within your uh, community. As far as uh, prevention, I think what, what really would be helpful, helpful would be for, um, you know, for traffickers to be um, tried as traffickers, not to go to, to lesser crimes. Um, I would also say uh, we can place higher fines in businesses participating in exploitive practices, um, and we can address vulnerabilities that lead to human trafficking, such as homelessness, poverty, displacement as a result of war, addiction, um, so on and so forth. Thank you so much, Maya, for sharing all of that. You know, I hope people visit the resources that you mentioned. It's so great to get educated on all these issues and just figure out ways that you can help in your community and, you know, knowing that that's how you help victims of human trafficking as well. So thank you so much for your time and looking forward to hearing more from you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to our broadcast today and to my guest, Maya Hasek. To learn more about Tapestry, visit tapestry.org. That's T-A-P-E-S-T-R-I.org. To hear more NRCDV podcasts and to access additional resources, you could visit nrcdv.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at NRCDV. Policy and Advocacy in Action is an NRCDV radio broadcast product brought to you by the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence. Support is provided by the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families, Family and Youth Services Bureau, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks again.